Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you with us here today for our 52nd episode of This is CDR. Uh, this is CDR is an online event series presented by OpenAir to explore the range of carbon removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and contextualize them for policy proposals. OpenAir seeks to advance at every level of government here in the U.S., as we'll see today, um, as well as national and subnational jurisdictions um, globally. If you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. My name is Toby Bryce. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on CDR policy advocacy and market development with OpenAir. If you're not familiar with Open Air, uh, just a quick background, we're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis, our growing global community. Uh, we work together on shared open source missions in the areas of policy advocacy, research and development, and activist uh, CDR market development. Should be a link in the chat to sign up to join our group. Um, we organize ourselves and communicate on Discord, which is like Slack, and we have lots of interesting projects uh, happening and would love to have you be a part of what we're doing. Before we get started, um, this is probably unnecessary at this point for our audience, but just uh, we think it's important to um, really define the terms that we're uh, talking about when we talk about carbon removal. This definition is from a great um, resource called the CDR Primer, um, which is basically a textbook uh, for carbon removal and was actually just issued in hardcover so you can get your own copy for your shelf. Um, <clears throat> but, and it's also essentially the same definition that the IPCC uses. Uh, it's purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Two important points to call out when we talk about CDR. Number one, CDR is not the same as carbon capture, quote unquote, which typically refers to point source capture of CO2 from, a, uh, from an emissions source, uh, such as a natural gas power plant or a cement plant. Um, this may or may not be a good climate solution, depending on the specific circumstances, but it's one thing it's not is carbon removal, which again is removing CO2 from the atmosphere and then durably storing it. Um, number two, um, anyone who works in CDR, it's very important. And I think we Everyone agrees on this, but it's important to call it out that carbon removal is in no way, shape or form any sort of substitute for reducing emissions. We need to reduce emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, we're not going to be able to reduce all of our emissions in a climate relevant time frame. For example, the agricultural sector is, is a third of global emissions or food, the food system is a third of global emissions, and we're not going to be able to remove those in the next couple of decades. So we're also going to need to um, be working on carbon removal. The IPCC estimates, and there's pretty clear scientific consensus at this point, that gigaton scale carbon removal will be required by mid-century if we want to have any chance of limiting warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. That's billions of tons per year. We're currently removing thousands of tons per year, so we have a lot of work to do. And then moreover, the second half of the century, there are trillions of tons of anthropogenic CO2 already in the atmosphere. And as we can already see, our climate is becoming increasingly unsafe and unhealthy. So the second half of the century, in addition to um, our hard to abate emissions, we're going to need to start removing the legacy CO2 we have in the atmosphere. So for all these reasons, carbon removal is an essential climate solution, along with reducing emissions and adapting to our current um, changed climate. And we need to be working on all of these uh, together at the same time. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mega Raghavan, um, and she's going to talk a little bit about run of show, and then she will introduce today's speakers. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Mega. I'm an Open Air member based in London, uh, working on some policy advocacy opportunities out in the US where I'm from. Um, so quick housekeeping notes as usual, our format will be a quick presentation followed by some prepared questions and then moderated audience Q&A. So please type any questions you have into Zoom's Q&A box as we go along. Um, that's separate from the chat box, so make sure you find the one labeled Q&A to help us organize it better. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send the video link out to everyone who registered as well as post it to OpenAir's website and to our YouTube channel. So this week on This is CDR, we're very pleased to welcome Boulder County Director of Sustainability, Susie Strife. City of Flagstaff climate analyst Ramon Alatore and Open Air's own Chris Meadle to discuss locally led CDR and introduce the Four Corners Carbon Coalition. A uh, little bit about Susie. So Susie leads Boulder County's Office of Sustainability, Climate Action and Resilience, providing direction on policies and program implementation for internal and external sustainability activities while managing planning efforts and budgets. She also serves as the key li liaison to other county agencies to support existing projects and to guide the county towards a more sustainable future. 
Susie received her PhD from the University of Colorado in 2009 and often teaches courses on sustainability, green design, and environmental sociology. Uh, Ramon Dice Alatore is the climate analyst for the city of Flagstaff. Uh, he joined the city in January of 2020, and on his second day on the job, he watched as the Flagstaff community completely updated his job description as they gave hours of testimony late into the night, demanding that the council adopt a resolution declaring a climate emergency. Things haven't slowed down since. In addition to helping to advance the development and adoption of the carbon neutrality plan, Ramon is also responsible for, um, for overseeing many of the programs and initiatives related to clean energy, electrification, and carbon removal. Ramon earned a BS in chemistry and an MS in environmental science and engineering. In a prior life, he liked climbing and backpacking leadership expeditions, and though it's no longer his job, he can still be found on the rocks and trails in and around Flagstaff. And lastly, a little bit about Chris. Uh, so Chris is a co-founder of Open Air, which is a global volunteer collective launched in 2019 to advance carbon dioxide removal or CDR through member-driven advocacy. In this role, Chris has developed, has helped to lead advocacy efforts at the state level uh, related to low carbon concrete procurement policy, including the Low Embodied, low embodied Carbon Concrete Leadership Act or LECLA. Uh, as well as carbon removal procurement and incentives, including the New York Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act, the New York Carbon City Property Tax Abatement Act, and the Luxembourg Negative Emissions Tariff. Chris came to CDR and Low Carbon Concrete from a 15-year career in solar energy, which spent diverse research, activist, and project management roles in North America, South Asia, Afghanistan, and East Africa. Chris is an upstate New York native and a longtime Brooklyn resident current, currently based in Austin, Texas. Uh, so, Chris, I think it's over to you to present. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Really excited to be here and uh, to be joined by Susan and Ramon. <clears throat> so I'm going to give a short presentation, then we'll get right into the discussion and Q&A. Let's go ahead and present. Megan, let me know if you can see that. Yep, you're good. All right, great. So what we'll do is uh, focus on uh, today's discussion again to you know, speak more broadly, I think, first, obviously, we'll explain what Four Corners is, but the why of it, um, what really motivate, motivated its formation, and what special role we think that local leadership can play in the present and the future of CDR. But just to quickly describe, I think there's been some references to Four Corners on previous, this is CDRs, and certainly uh, in many different uh, open air related events. But what Four Corners seeks to do in essence is to really allow local governments and communities to play a direct role in catalyzing local carbon removal projects, particularly innovative new projects by sharing resources and collaborating together in decision-making on project selection. And we'll describe a little more detail about what that is. But what I wanted to do is just give you a bit of the very short history or origins of where the coalition came from, which is kind of an interesting one. Uh, and so last summer, uh, Boulder and Flagstaff, uh, who were independently exploring carbon removal, met uh, on a call that I was on uh, back last summer and realized that in parallel, without knowledge that the other was doing it, they had both looked at carbon dioxide removal and were formally now incorporating it as part of their uh, overall response to the climate emergency. And during the discussion, we'll get in a little bit more into that history. So that connection was made. And as I said, Open Air was a, was a participant in that conversation. And very early on, we thought, well, if you two are doing this, and maybe you're most out in public about it or furthest along, there have to be other local governments around the United States, particularly the thousands that have pledged some form of emissions reduction or climate emergency commitment, who are also beginning to look at this. Uh, who might be able to partner. And so is there a basis here where we could create a kind of a network or a coalition of local governments trying to figure this out together so we're not all doing it in isolation? So that idea incubated and marinated for several months. We had an initial um, webinar that we did last November during COP26 in Glasgow, where we sort of really publicly announced our intention to form this coalition. We were really excited. Not too long later, uh, we were able to, through work with Boulder County, uh, partner with Carbon Direct, you know, one of the world's premier carbon removal consultancies, uh, you know, on methodologies and um, research and you know, market um, uh, market research. 
And they came in as a formal technical partner to help us think through, well, how would we develop a program like this for support for CDR that's specifically tailored for local communities and local governments? So we were very, very fortunate to have Carbon Direct join the team as a consultant. And then as we set out about to do this, we were, um, you know, over a period of many months, we spoke to many different uh, peer jurisdictions in the four corners areas of the United States. For those of you familiar, Boulder, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And we were incredibly excited last month that we had uh, both Salt Lake City in Utah and uh, in Santa Fe in New Mexico uh, join us as the founding members of this coalition to work on uh, our very first campaign, which I'll, I'll end this presentation to describe. So that's just a very short history of how this all took shape basically over the course of a year. Now, what I want to talk to you before we get into a discussion and bring Susie and Ramon in is, again, why, why is CDR relevant to the local or even maybe better stated, why, why, is, why are local communities uh, and local governments really relevant to the present and the future of carbon dioxide rules? So I wanted to present a couple of the big ideas that animate the Four Corners Coalition, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. And I think one thing that's really important to kind of stress, and you pick this up if you spend any time, not just in the climate space, but in CDR, is that it's, it's a massive problem. It's a massive opportunity. It's just massive <laughs> in scale. And that's the way that we always talk about it. And in fact, there's a, um, a sort of a, a tendency for us to you know, stress that in order to elevate the importance of it is how big it is, right? And so when we talk about both what our obligation is, what we actually have to do, um, you, know, you can look to reports like that the IPCC has reported over the last uh, few years is that quantifying that we need to remove you know, hundreds of billions or thousands of billions of tons over the course of the century from the atmosphere. When you look at some of the literature now on what is the, the market opportunity look like, and you, you see you know, big giant figures like it's gonna be a trillion dollar industry uh, that has to take shape in order for us to take those billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere by 2050. So there's all these massive sort of terms, superlative kind of uh, words that are associated with carbon removal, gigatons, billions, trillions. It has to last for a thousand years or a hundred. Um, we have to do this in 25 years or hundred years. And when you look at it from this sort of scale or elevation or time frame, it can get lost. You know, you, you can actually start to draw certain assumptions about, well, what are the solutions going to be like and who is going to drive it when we're talking about something so big and daunting? And so often the who, our minds gravitate that this has to be something that is decided by the most powerful, influential people in the world, both in government, in the private sector. That's who will do it. Um, uh, how is this going to happen? Um, we notice that when you talk about big billions of ton types of problems, it tends to bias our minds, I think, towards a set of solutions that kind of look like the problem. So I think there's an assumption that when we talk about this, that means that very big, gigantic solutions are going to be the only way that we're going to meet the needs that we have to as far as carbon removal. And when you look at it that way and your mind is sort of biased towards the big, I guess, and the massive, it can be easy to sort of um, overlook the importance of local actors in really making this happen, but shaping how it happens, perhaps most importantly. And the way I think about it, again, being a participant in how these conversations are unfolding, involved in a lot of the education and outreach around CDR, particularly to local groups, there's a sort of a somewhat dangerous, I think, kind of framework that's kind of set in where there's a sense that, you know, by brute force, we have to install this infrastructure in the coming years. And the local is just the place where we do it. You know, it's almost like a placeless surface uh, on which these, uh, this capacity has to take root. And that's causing some misgivings or confusions or hesitations or ambivalence among not only the activist community, but the public at large. What are we, what are we signing up for, for signing up for carbon dioxide rule? And that's a major problem. Uh, that's something that we, we proactively and creatively have to address. And so what we think at um, Four Corners is, you know, there's this term that is usually where the conversation sort of ends when we think about the public's involvement in carbon dioxide rule. It's about acceptance. We use the term social acceptance, that ultimately we have to convince the public that this is a good thing to do. Uh, they have to sort of um, assent to it. Um, and what we think at Four Corners is it's sort of beyond social acceptance. We think there's so much more value and importance that local actors can add beyond just saying yes to projects that are 
coming from them uh, from on high or from external places. And that's what we really want to tap into and explore and mobilize with Four Corners. We think specifically the local and local actors can not only adopt or cite CDR assets, but we can actually, through our own interventions, creatively shape what CDR innovation looks like. Uh, how is it going to take place? What does it involve? We can be the, the co-authors of that. Uh, and then what we can also do, which the local governments have demonstrated, again, is always generally being ahead of the curve compared to higher levels of subnational or national governments, and that we can potentially move on carbon dioxide removal faster, particularly if we collaborate in partnerships, which is what Four Corners is really built entirely around. And so there's four principles that you can find on our new website, which launched over the weekend. I think Mega will drop the link to that. There's kind of four main principles, I would say, that, that our, our work and our approach is based on. One, as I just said, is local leadership. We don't have to have a passive role and wait for projects to come to us, but we can set up conditions where we catalyze projects. Uh, we, we can be the, the ones who, who, who kick things off uh, together. Uh, local imagination. This is a really, really critical part as someone who's worked at multiple levels of government in terms of my activism and, and, and in the private sector is that at the local level, you know, as we look at carbon dioxide removal, we're not talking about one thing. We're talking about many different things. And that's the technologies and pathways that range from nature-based solutions all the way to things like uh, direct air capture and mineralization. But the reality is, is that the opportunities present themselves when you look on the ground, uh, when you can think creatively about what are the resources that we actually have in a given place and how can they be leveraged or how can they be the basis of carbon dioxide removal or carbon dioxide removal business models? So we think those at the local level have a certain visibility on those opportunities that might not be uh, as visible from higher elevation of, of, of governance. Um, local accountability. And again, this is where most of the conversation revolves, but we think if projects are being initiated at the local levels with local leaders, uh, with input uh, from local stakeholders, that's the best way to ensure that we put guardrails around any type of project, that we're going to minimize or eliminate the possibility of harm and also select for other co-benefits that are actually going to add value to a community. And then the last part, which is maybe what's most distinct around this, is collaboration, is that we understand that alone, any particular jurisdiction, whether it's a town or a city or a county, um, they might have that creativity. They might have the willingness to move forward, but in many cases, resources are limited uh, for them to alone maybe have the kind of impact that they potentially could if they collaborated with other uh, peer governments, if they formed networks where they would jointly support uh, projects together. And that's the pooling together of not only financial resources, but also knowledge um, and, and ideas uh, across different jurisdictions. And so that is really the secret sauce we think of Four Corners is that aggregation uh, that it's based on of bringing together partners to work together and uh, select and support CDR projects. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there's an enormous, uh, just in the United States alone, this could obviously be uh, global in scope and maybe one day will be, but there are thousands of local governments on every level that have formally uh, stated or articulated or enacted emissions reductions goal or responses to climate change. So there's a lot of governments that are out there. And many of them, we think, are in the same position that Boulder County and Flagstaff and Salt Lake City and Santa Fe are, where they, they've done the numbers. They understand what they have to do to meet their goals. And they're increasingly seeing carbon removal as being a part of it and that they would, they would benefit from working together with their peers in the same region or nationally. And so when we think about who, uh, rather than you know, the, the rarefied you know, tippy top of the, the, the power elite, we, we see that, that it's towns and cities and counties and even public institutions in those jurisdictions that can play a catalytic role in driving carbon dioxide rule in the real world. And the how, what we think is particularly when we look across partners who again have visibility on these opportunities, and Susie will talk to this really directly in the experience she's had in Boulder County, is that opportunities for CDR arise when you look on the ground. And so what we think by creating these kinds of partnerships, um, that we're going to be able to see opportunities for implementing carbon dioxide removal that aren't just the big uniform uh, forms of infrastructure, but rather 
more diverse things that are that are really inspired by the local assets that communities have. And in terms of our process, which we're testing out for the first time, I'll, I'll talk about that at the last minute or so of, of my presentation, is that we want it ultimately, we're beginning right now with the, with the four governments that I mentioned, but this is going to be a platform where local governments of any kind could team up and say, well, this is where we want to actually solicit proposals uh, for interesting CDR projects. So the process is, is the formation of a partnership. And we can see those being, again, small towns in the same area, sister cities across larger geographies. We're pretty open uh, in terms of the kinds of partnerships that could form. But it starts with the formation of a partnership and an intent to support uh, CDR projects jointly. Um, as part of the process that we've developed is uh, the partners then would take stock of what are the opportunities for carbon dioxide removal that are shared across their jurisdiction and create a kind of a scope, both financially in terms of what's possible in terms of support, but thematically, what types of CDRs? Is there something really specific or relevant to our region that we want to structure uh, our, um, our campaign around? Um, and then we go through a process, which we're just kicking off right now with our first one, is creating an application process where uh, applicants can actually submit requests for catalytic grants. And that's what we're supporting here is, can we provide financial resources that allow a cool, innovative type of project that fits our theme to move forward? Uh, gap funding is another way to sort of think about it. So we have a two month process where we can receive applications and then review them and make a, make a selection. And then the last part, which we're really excited about, we think is a very novel element of this program, and we draw this from our experience and other forms of local mobilization, like Solarize and Community Solar, is that if you have that first core group of communities that does the work of review and selection and picks projects, as part of the application for this, applicants can list if there's another project that they might be able to realize with additional funding, uh, apart from what they're actually seeking funding for, for this initial grant. And that's what we call the multiplier phase, where if that's the case, then we'll invite other governments and say, hey, we just vetted this project. This is why we picked it. They might be able to build another plant or another project in our region if they had X amount of resources. So we'll try to recruit a larger sort of second tier of communities to contribute. And that includes individuals because this will be, uh, we'll have a crowdfunding campaign built into it that will last two months. So the hope there is that we can immediately after our selection, start replicating the solutions uh, that we're funding. And to close out here, um, and we'll talk about this during the discussion, we're getting going on it. This has been a long time in the making, uh, but we finally uh, selected our theme with our four partners and we launched our application uh, actually yesterday. Uh, and the theme that we've chosen is how carbon removal can be linked to concrete, the production of concrete specifically. So that's the theme that we've selected. And the reason why we picked that is that it's the most common building material on earth. It's also a very carbon intensive one because of, of cement, which is used in it, but it's also an inherently local product in terms of its production. Uh, the production of concrete is distributed in small plants that are close to where the concrete is used. There's over 7,000 ready mix concrete plants in the United States. So all of our communities have concrete uh, production within our vicinity and we all certainly use it. And what we've also discovered when you look at emerging CDR technologies, there are multiple opportunities to potentially integrate carbon removal into concrete, both in the production of it, its use, and then even it, the management of its waste at the end of its life cycle. So this is a, uh, a theme that we know will get very diverse types of applications in for, and that we think have not yet been done yet or, or, or very close to. So Again, a main goal that we have here is catalyzing new types of projects that can ultimately scale, but making sure that we're the ones who help them happen first. And concrete is a really, really ripe terrain, as we've talked about many times before in open air uh, for carbon dioxide removal. So just a summary here, tomorrow we are having a webinar for applicants, which Mega will uh, post that or Toby in the chat. And this is us going over the application, the eligibility criteria, anybody can attend but certainly any companies out there that think that they might have a solution uh, that would be eligible. We have a total catalytic grant fund of around 300,000. We expect to award multiple awards uh, for different types of uh, projects that come in. Uh, the application period, as I said, kicked off yesterday. It's a two month application period. 
then it will close. And then we'll have our review and selection uh, period uh, with uh, expert input from carbon direct scientists and subject experts. And then we'll make our selection by January 10th and uh, announce them. And that will also then begin the beginning of our that multiplier phase, which will allow other communities to uh, go. So that is where I'll leave it here. Hopefully that gave a good um, overview. But I want to also just stress is that this is our sort of first go at it. And the hope is, is that we can have communities uh, all over the country and the world uh, forming partnerships to try to catalyze new forms of CDR and that they'll use Four Corners as their platform and benefit from all the accumulated knowledge that each campaign gains by joining that coalition. And so we're going to go ahead and have a conversation right now and take people's questions. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Nice work, Chris. I have to say, this is such an inspiring project. And I'm really excited to have you here and also Susie and Ramon. Um, hopefully, you guys can come on. Um, yeah. Um, so please meet Susie and Ramon. Um, and uh, Maybe to start with you guys with a quick question. Chris mentioned in the top of his presentation that Boulder and Flagstaff were independently in and around the same time starting to think about and talk about carbon removal as part of your broader climate strategy um, in either order that you want to go. Can you share a little bit more about how you started thinking about it and how, you know where this came from? Sure. And <laughs> thanks for having us. And, and yeah, this is so wonderful to be on this platform because this um, this is CDR has helped me initiate a lot of my thinking around this, so I appreciate just it being full circle. Um, so I'm sure Ramon, you have a lot to say here, but Boulder County, similar to Flagstaff, we really have aggressive climate goals, and we know now that direct emissions reductions are really not sufficient, um, as Chris mentioned, to stem the worst impacts of climate change. So. I see ourselves in this space, um, Ramon and I, as the first responders to the climate crisis in our own communities. And local governments really are facing the increased burden of resourcing the preparation for, response to, and now the recovery from climate change impacts. And so we understand now that CDR is like a much needed complementary strategy to any serious talk about abating climate change. And let me be clear, as, as Open Air is so clear about this, this does not mean that our focus is not on deep and you know, rapid emissions reductions first. It just means that we understand that we have a role to play in fostering carbon dioxide removal. And so for us in Boulder County, it was really interesting. There were a bunch of different signals, and we can get into this in a little bit, that pointed us in the direction of CDR. And one of them was an RFP that I drafted in the summer of 2000. And 21, which was looking for really high quality carbon offsets or carbon removal projects to offset the cannabis sector. And so for background, we really had this requirement or carbon fee, if you will, that requires commercial cannabis cultivators to either offset their electricity use with renewable energy completely, or they need to pay a two cent fee on their KWH usage above a commercial baseline. And so we had this fund and with that offset fund, we were really trying to understand what was possible in spending that to offset the entire cannabis industry. So we went out to RFP um, using the Oxford offsetting principles that basically highlight the importance of um, you know, carbon removal and carbon removal offsets. And we really quickly found out in the response to that RFP, it was a great learning opportunity to really understand firsthand the lack of high quality supply in the marketplace for CDR, and it revealed for us the need to kind of start like funding pilots and projects and the development of this whole sector because it's so early stage. And so that, yeah, spawned a lot of different thinking around incubation. And from that RFP, Chris Nido called me up and said, hey, really cool RFP. Did you know I want to introduce you to Flagstaff? They've been doing some really important work in setting the stage for carbon removal and so that's when I met Ramon and I'll hand it over to you to Ramon. Ramon. Fabulous, thank you, Susie. Um, also very glad to be here on This is CDR. Uh, I guess the story in our community actually goes a little bit back to the introduction that Mega provided uh, for me. Uh, it was my second day on the job when the community came forward with this two page resolution um, and spent hours uh, 
making the case to council that they needed to formally adopt a climate emergency declaration. And it was the community in that two page declaration that uh, spelled out the goal, which was for us carbon neutrality. And they also spelled out the timeline, which for us is 2030. Um, so that's that's coming up very quickly. Um, and as we began to do community engagement and sort of like unpack this goal and timeline that had been brought forward, it's clear that once you bring on the framework of carbon neutrality, that you're going to have to have serious conversations about uh, the removal side of the equation, right? Um, because we're, we're not going to be able to reduce our emissions uh, by 2030 to zero. Uh, so th there's going to have to be something over there. Uh, and as we engage the community in conversations about that, it was pretty clear that they had strong opinions about what would and would not be socially acceptable. As, as Chris was mentioning, one of the things about this sort of coalition and, and, and putting our fingerprints on this is that we have an opportunity to engage uh, and, and kind of move the needle on that social acceptability and, you know, simply paying $8 for offsets to pay someone to not push over a tree was not going to be sufficient. Like we should do all sorts of uh, landscape restoration and, and things in that space, but that is not what the community was asking when they were asking for carbon neutrality. Um, and so we arrived at carbon removal through just a 18 month process really of uh, community engagement and understanding that um, their vision for what would be the removal side needed to be local and regional projects in the region uh, or projects as much of the, our removal portfolio that could be developed in that way is how they wanted it to be developed that had local co-benefits um, that produced jobs perhaps moving towards that trillion dollar industry that Chris uh, was mentioning as well. Um, but that's where we needed to start first. And, and similar to what Susie mentioned, the Oxford offsetting principles sort of came into our orbit and we put those right in our uh, climate or our carbon neutrality plan. I think we might have been one of the first to say, you know, here's the Oxford offsetting principles in our plan ex exactly. Um, and so, you know, really it was based on the guidance that our community gave us. And, and in some ways, I've become uh, you know, one of the messengers to to council and, and being able to be part of this project to say, this is what the community has taught me. Um, and that's just been a really uh, rewarding experience. And just dovetailing on that a little bit, can you characterize, and I'm, I assume it ranges, but what, what do you hear from your local communities about carbon removal? Like what kind of feedback, questions, concerns, praise? I mean, what, what's, like, what do you hear on the ground? I'll give a, a first shot at it, but it's still very mixed, right? I think there's a lot of hand-wringing and consternation about the sort of legacy of the traditional offset programs. Um, and you know, people looking at companies that have made carbon neutrality claims and being like kind of you know, squinting their eyes, raising their eyebrows, um, and wanting to make sure that that's not what we're talking about. You know, I know John Oliver just dropped a, an episode all about offsets. Right. And as I was watching that one, um, you know, I found myself just kind of like nodding along and being like, that's what my community told me two years ago, <laughs> right, is to not like go in that direction in terms of this. So it feels like every time I engage the, those that are sort of, I guess, uh, climate literate are like they're coming with a little bit of like, are you are you talking about offsets or are you talking about something new? And then if we're once we get to have that sort of next level of conversation, uh, there can be some excitement there, uh, certainly. But um, it is it is still a big part of what I think this coalition is doing is needing to uh, contribute to the shifting in narrative of the, this is necessary but not sufficient and how do we do it in a meaningful way. Um, but it, it's never sort of just a unanimous, oh, we get it right away in a media. Yeah. I mean, it's such an important dialogue and it's so great that it's happening locally in your in your communities. Um, Susie, what kinds of things do you hear in um, Boulder County? Yeah, it's similar to what Ramon just shared, but you know, our constituents are so concerned about climate change. And I think this is sort of, um, yeah, we are, we've experienced recently a lot of climate emergencies and climate related disasters here. And so I think there's a lot of, thank goodness, there's a lot of trust, both, both because Boulder County is traditionally historically seen as, as kind of a leader in the innovation space in climate, but also because we have per capita, the most amazing group of climate scientists, climate engineers, climate practitioners, and all of the national labs that sort of couch 
our community. And so we're teaming with experts who really foster and support our work. And so as much as there might be some skepticism, once they understand that we're working in unison with some of the world's most foremost carbon practitioners and carbon accounting um, uh, experts, et cetera, like at Carbon Direct and with Chris Nidal and Open Air, they know and understand that we're working as hard as possible to under, you know, to really address this correctly and to represent our local community and sort of the benefit, the co-benefits that come along with um, CDR from a community perspective. So we feel very fortunate that even though there might be some initial skepticism, that a lot of people are are mostly in support. Yeah. That's great. I mean, you're both blessed too, because you have so many amazing, as you referenced, um, resources for carbon removal in your areas, both geographically, but then the mines as well at Colorado State and Colorado and Arizona uh, Center for Negative Carbon Emissions. I think we have John Surucci on the call today. Hello, John. Um, and Travertine and Boulder, who was on the program recently. So, so many, um, so many great local resources for you. Um, one last question for me, and then um, I want to switch it over to Mega because we do want to leave plenty of time for audience questions. Questions, so please keep um, keep those coming in. But um, for me, one of the most exciting, you know, we're talking about offsetting and the Ox uh, Oxford offsetting principles. But as Ramon, as you both alluded to, this isn't really about offsetting per se. It's really a focus on catalyzing innovation in a local context and not, you know, short term carbon accounting and trying to find the cheapest offsets that we can find to you know meet a net zero commitment. Um, can you talk a little bit more about? where that came from and how you arrived at that focus and why you think that's a, an important approach? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and let you step in, Ramon, whenever. But um, I love this question because it's really at the heart of this for us at Boulder County, at least, really about um, pooling our purchasing power, pooling sort of our resources with other communities and propelling things forward. And that I love the concept of incubation because I, I think what we're in for this is catalyzation of the entire market um, and nurturing that both locally and regionally. And every day I ask myself this question of like, what is the role of local government with climate action? And most of the response in my brain, at least, and, and in unison with a lot of my uh, colleagues has been the highest impact possible that we can have is really showcasing what's possible at the local level and then scaling that, right? And showing what's possible at the national level. And local governments have done this for so long, whether that's initiating localized policies that then lead to state policies that then, you know, feed into national policies um, or, you know, starting some type of incubation uh, funding or piloting projects and then replicating that with, you know, augmentation of grant funding, et cetera. So I'm really happy that this is more of a philanthropic model of, of again, show, showcasing what's possible with catalyzed funding versus, yeah, looking at the total carbon removal volume. Any other thoughts, Roman, on that? Honestly, Susie said it really, really well. I think you know, for us, the the carbon or the Oxford offsetting principles and those conversations that I've mentioned with the community, we're making it clear that um, you know the type of projects that we were going to need uh, might not be like the most like efficient dollar per ton, but like we're looking to we're looking to catalyze an industry potentially. We're looking. Uh, you know, I know that in a lot of these spaces, the curves come up, whether it's bringing cost curves down or, you know, volume curves up and sort of dabbling in that space in terms of how can we, um, you know, put our funds and in, in, uh, in collaboration and coalition in order to kind of drive these things forward. It's not about kind of the next two years. It's about the next 30 years. Yeah, that's great. And just on the innovation front, are there any particular um sectors of carbon removal that you find particularly exciting and also relevant to your communities? Um, any, any, any favorites or like personal interests? Well, I do think we arrived at concrete for a reason. Uh, beyond concrete, I know that, uh, you know, in our Four Corners region, um, something that I'm really interested in uh, is certainly the, the, biochar space and you know our community is one when I presented to council and we were talking about like how is it that you can do nature-based CDR um, you know, obviously planting trees comes to mind but our community is, is one like many in the western United States that has a hundred years of like fire suppression history and frankly part of our 
Our story is that we have too much biomass in the forests. Uh, and so trying to figure out how to deal with that has been, there's been a real biomass bottleneck. And there's even sort of a, a turning of phrase talking about a lot of the biomass being liability biomass. It's, it's worse than no value or low value biomass. It's actually a liability. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to see what happens in some of those spaces. And I think that those types of solutions will certainly be um, relevant to our region. Absolutely agree. Cool. Um, Megan, do you want to um, come on and ask a few audience questions? And everyone, please keep those coming and put them in the um, Zoom Q&A box. Yeah, great. So the first question we got was just, can you talk a little bit more about specifically how you engage the community and, you know, people um, in your in your cities or counties uh, while kind of going through the planning phases of this project? Yeah, sure. I'll start there because, you know, we, as mentioned before, we have this cannabis fund and we're, we're supporting the Four Corners Carbon Coalition with the cannabis fund. But we are also super fortunate to have a localized sustainability tax um, that supports a ton of our climate action work. And so there's been a bunch of constituent meetings and stakeholder process to not only get that passed, but also what, what should the funding be spent on. Much of that fund goes to emission reduction projects, yet one of the streams of revenue uh, goes to a climate innovation fund that basically is a localized CDR fund. So we've been, a, we've been in great conversations with a lot of our local kind of climate pioneers here. And it's kind of the spirit of nurturing, again, more of this localized um, incubator for high quality carbon remo removal projects that also support community co-benefit and outcomes for the community. Um, it's pretty clear that a lot of our community wants to spend a majority of our resources, our precious resources here on localized place-based projects or as I like to call them kind of charismatic carbon projects. Um, so we need to source those projects. And in order to source those projects, we have to have a lot of community input on what, like what's out there. And so we did put out a call for proposals and a very competitive process. And we've had an amazing interaction with a lot of local, again, climate pioneers, I call them, who are responding to this climate innovation fund. And, um, we've been able to support five distinct projects out of a very rigorous process. And two of those are kind of decentralized biochar projects. And um, the other three are really, really interesting applications for uh, nature-based solutions in carbon removal. So we've had a lot of interaction with um, both our constituency kind of on the sustainability tax and sort of our emission reduction projects. And then on this other side, this really neat localized fund for supporting climate innovation and carbon removal projects that have, again, community co-benefits. Um, but the regional play really is the Four Corners Carbon Coalition is very exciting to me because I, I think we can have a much more, you know, impact at scale utilizing those lessons learned from the local context. So that's what is really exciting about the interaction with our local community because we can kind of, again, replicate the story outward to support the Four Corners Carbon Coalition. Great. Uh, anything else, uh, other, if you wanted to add? Um, I would just add one thing too, is that from the very outset, when we started this conversation, I was always, as you can imagine, looking at it from a, an open air perspective. And I, I actually see you're going to, in some instances have, you know, thought leading, you know, pioneering thinkers that are working within city or county government, like Susie and Ramon and our, their, their peers at uh, Salt Lake city and uh, Santa Fe but we think in many cases, the way that this is going to happen in the first place, be brought to the attention of, you know, Susie and Ramon's counterparts and other parts in other cities and jurisdictions in the world is through activism. It's going to be through open air members that are going to say, I want to get this done in Cape Cod or South Florida or wherever I am. And they're going to they're going to bring it to the city and uh, try to do it. And that that process will involve a lot of community involvement. It will actually come out of the community. So just wanted to make that as an advertisement for the open air community too, that you, you know where to find me if you're interested in doing this. <laughs> and, and I will just plug that too, because open air um, constituents have been, activists, supporters have been instrumental in kind of this complementary process of policymaking. So they've been showing up to a lot of interesting meetings at the state and with our representatives talking about the importance of, again, complementing what we're doing at the local level with statewide policy to support 
carbon removal. So it's really exciting. And, and I, yeah, I really love when open air activists get involved because that just propels us forward even more. Big shout out to Melanie Trent, who I know is uh, in the audience today, and she's uh, one of those amazing activists uh, in, in Colorado. Great. Um, no, it's great to hear. Um, okay, the next one we had, I, we had a couple on kind of how the coalition, I guess, apportions thing, you know, responsibility and things. So first of all, on the budget side, um, how does each of the partners kind of determine what their contribution is? Is there like a benchmark for what's there or do different sort of entities decide what they want to put in? And then on the other side, like who kind of claims credit for any, any offsets or any carbon credits that you generate out of the program? Well, that's a really important question. I think for this first year, Boulder County has invested a little bit more in the seed funding component, um, just because again, we have this cannabis uh, offset fund to work with. Um, and I think other communities are contributing what's possible in terms of thought leadership, as well as um, secured resources financially. And so what is so wonderful about this coalition is that to us, it, it does not matter. The end result matters more than, again, who's contributing and, um, you know, who's allocating more. It's really a partnership. And that's how we're kind of initiating, again, this first kind of seed round of funding, um, or I guess the inaugural funding of this. Ramon, do you want to add to that? No, that's great. I mean, obviously, Boulder County, you know, in some ways has been... Uh, they're, they're ahead of the curve in the sense of the, having the, the tax authority like specific to this. You know, I think one of the things that we're hopeful of and expecting is that by, by executing this, by being able to like show a model, that also starts to like give other local governments um, you know, some ideas about like what is it that we need to do in order to be able to have access to funds that we can put towards these types of projects, towards innovation, towards business development. How are, how are you going to sort of develop that authority? Uh, that, that can be a sticking point sometimes for uh, local governments. And so if there's, you know, communities that are looking and saying, we want to do that, but I'm not even sure if we could do it today, you know, that, that gives them opportunities to just even think sort of on the policy side about uh, being able to move in that direction. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to, to be able to work with a forward thinking community like Boulder that is able to like really help with the, the seed funding, certainly, but also, uh, sort of the, the participation and collaboration and, and getting to that multiplier phase where we're really excited about everything that, uh, all of the communities are going to be able to bring to the table in terms of learnings, right. And going through this process and is like, is four communities, like the right number of chefs in the kitchen, uh, to be able to review proposals and, um, you know, what, what sort of process are we all going through? And I, I think we're going to, we know we're going to learn a lot of things along the way, uh, and be able to then share those learnings to say, Hey, if there are, you know, communities in Cape Cod that like want to get together and create a little trifecta and move forward, here's how we did it. Here's what we learned. Here's the barriers we had. And then maybe, you know, the second one can, uh, can learn from some of that. So I think there's so much of this is also just about the process side and making sure that we are uh, taking notes uh, along the entire uh, way so that we can share those learnings with other communities. Yeah, and I want to say also just more generally speaking, beyond this particular first instance, we want to be very flexible about what these look like, both not just in terms of who participates, but the scale of the project. Because again, the idea is surfacing innovation. And some of these types of solutions aren't necessarily going to be very, very expensive. In fact, there's a, um, some representatives from one community with a really interesting biochar environmental mitigation strategy that they're interested in, you know, potential four quarters participation in down the line. And that wouldn't take a lot of money. And, and, and the same thing in terms of how local governments formally participate, it can be instances where you have public funds. Maybe there's funding that's available to contribute to that, but there might be some campaigns that are more Here's the formal endorsement and the promotion of the project from a local government. And then most of it's going to come from individual and philanthropic sources. So we want to be very open uh, as we go forward uh, so that it fits for different types of goals, not all just replicating exactly what we've done here with the first, uh, first campaign. Yeah, that's great. I think we had a couple of questions on kind of coordinating other local governments and helping them. So that's great that you're already thinking about re replicability. Um, 
We had a question just thinking, you know, what you were saying earlier about decarbonization uh, not being enough. So how are you thinking about decarbonization? Are you setting separate targets for that versus carbon removal? Um, and kind of how are you uh, splitting up the two responsibilities if you are setting separate targets? Ramon, <laughs> I'm happy to answer too, but go ahead. Get started. So certainly for us, when we were developing the carbon neutrality plan, it sort of feels like there are the two sides of the scale. There's the decarbonization side and there's sort of the like what's left over side, right? And, and that just sort of becomes the removal obligation if in fact we're going to be holding ourselves accountable to the framework of carbon neutrality. Um, and so they are they are somewhat separate you know it feels like you you read through the pages pages of our plan and it's like the first seven target areas are all about dealing with transportation and buildings and energy uh and everything like that and, and like again all of our energy still needs to go in that and then we also need to be thinking about how is it that we're going to address that removal side so um for us they are somewhat separate in, in the way that we kind of bucket them and think about them. And it, a tremendous amount of energy is still happening on that decarbonization side, but we're also investing uh, thought energy into like, how are we going to uh, ramp up uh, sort of our removal portfolio that we're needing to have sort of fostered and developed it to, so that it is uh, a robust thing that we'll be able to utilize when, when we do start uh, holding ourselves sort of accountable to the framework. Okay, yeah. so it's about like, I guess, types of emissions and what you would uh, think is more possible to decarbonize versus what's going to be harder to abate. Yeah, I think a lot of communities have sector-based emission reduction targets similar to states, right? And so we sort of tackle each of those sec sectors differently. And then carbon removal is kind of its own <laughs> five pages of our climate action plan at this point, right? So it's just, it's just, it's a different approach. Um, and again, because we're not after carbon removal sort of tonnage or, or, or totals right now, we're just after nurturing this market and, and, and asking ourselves, what is that role of local government in terms of catalyzing um, projects and getting those projects to be high quality carbon removal projects? And so I think that's a very different question than like measuring emissions reductions uh, strategies and elect, you know, electrification or transportation sector. So um, we do see them a little bit differently, but they're, they're part nested into you know, one overarching goal of carbon neutrality. Okay. And do you guys have a sense of like what the split is between what's going to end up being decarbonization versus uh, removals in the end? I know, Ramon, you've done a lot of math on this. <laughs> but yes, we do. It's, it's laid out in all of our climate action plans for sure. We have, you know, 80% reduction by 2035. And then I think the rest is like a 10 to 15% with carbon removal. Right. And I think the answer to that largely depends on what is the time frame that the yes. community like pick right and so for us 2030 uh is closer uh and i think when we look at it it's like a 45 55 um 45 reductions 55 removal okay um and then last question i think before i hand this back to toby to finish this up um just in terms of you know how people have gotten involved and how people can get involved uh could you talk a little bit about how santa fe and uh, Salt Lake City got involved and just, you know, if other jurisdictions um, nearby are interested, uh, what would be the process of uh, reaching out to you guys and getting involved with that? Yeah, I mean, we, we actively recruited different um, colleagues of ours to participate in this, as well as we, we've been actively sought after um, in terms of other communities wanting to join. So it was a sort of a both and um, moment for us over, the, over this year. And we were really just so grateful that um, those communities, you know, are aligned with us both philosophically and for this sort of inaugural funding. Um, and I will say, we are excited to replicate this model in a way that it can be very easy for local governments. So as mentioned, I think Chris mentioned briefly that we are working with Carbon Direct, some of the world's leading sort of carbon scientists and, and technology firm that will help us and is co-creating with us a playbook for local governments in order to understand you know, where they can fit with, with, with supporting this initiative as well as CDR in general. And so that playbook is really supposed to map out exactly how um, local communities can, can participate in carbon removal and supporting sort of this initiative and their own initiatives. So that's really exciting for us because 
we not only are use, utilizing their scientific expertise for both the review proposal, but they're also helping, again, create this sort of map or playbook for local governments to participate um, in this. Yeah, and I, I, I want to just add one thing, just to really stress how grateful we are to Salt Lake City and Santa Fe for really taking their time to understand this, not cutting any corners, being incredibly thorough, but ultimately making a decision to join. It was really impressive to watch them go through that process. And we're incredibly grateful to fill out those other two corners. The other thing I want to point out too, which, you know, when you, when you talk to Susie and Ramon, you realize there's these existing networks where cities across regions or counties are always talking to each other about these things. And that's where we see most of the recruitment will happen. There'll be natural relationships between places where they'll, you know, we're not, we're not inventing that paradigm. That's one that exists that sort of, that our model sort of presupposes. And it's really, really important. And it's the same all over the country. So we want to tap those networks to form these groups. Great. Um, well, this has been amazing. Thank you guys so much for being here. And Toby, I will just let you finish this up. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, Susie and Ramon. I know, Susie, you might have to hop off, but thank you so much for being with us. It was fantastic. Super excited about the new um, campaign. Um, I put the wrong link first, but then I put the right link to the Eventbrite tomorrow for the workshop for potential applicants. Um, so if you are a carbon removal practitioner and you're interested in the CDR X concrete um, campaign that Four Corners Carbon Coalition is launching, um, please uh, check that out tomorrow. Um, one other thing, I think it's been said, but just uh, Four Corners Carbon Coalition is the name of the um, the the organization, but you don't have to be in the Four Corners um, region to participate. So anywhere you live, you can work on getting your local um, government to get involved here. So please reach out to us if you would like to talk about that. Um, thank you again to Susie, Ramon, and Chris for being with us. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And um, yeah, so we do have a federal CDRLA lobbying um, action happening. Um, so please reach out to us about that. It's the, the federal CDRLA is a procurement bill to get the federal government to start procuring carbon removal, just like these local governments are doing. Um, and uh, check out with Open Air for that. And then um, we are very, very excited for uh, two weeks from now, we have our next this is CDR with Selena Scott Buchler and Simone Stewart. Um, they put, put together some really amazing work about how the DAC hubs, which uh, the, the um, funding announcement is going to be coming out any moment. Um, they've been doing some great research on how DAC hubs can be equitably um, deployed. It's really important to take those considerations um, uh, in, into, into effect when you are when the government's thinking about this. Um, so looking forward to that one. Um, thank you all for being with us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.